Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Design and Dialogue 71. Um, my guest today is uh, Melanie Barnett. Uh, Melanie is an you hoo hoo. <laughs> Melanie is an artist, activist, and uh, legacy maker. I love that title. We're going to talk about all of your titles, Melanie. <laughs> and uh, the founder of the uh, Black Artists and Designers Guild. Um, among many other things. Uh, today, we're going to speak with uh, Melanie live from Brooklyn. Is that right? No, I'm in Philadelphia. You're in Philadelphia. Oh, yeah, okay. At school, okay. we'll talk about that. <laughs> okay, right, right, right. I forgot about that. Yeah, and we'll talk about uh, the fact that Melanie has now made a transition into grad school. So welcome, everyone. Join me uh, in welcoming Melanie. Hey. <laughs> How are you? I'm well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. This is exciting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it took a little while to get you on, but, but here you are. <laughs> I, know. I, know, I know you're a busy woman. Beyond. We won't talk about that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, uh, obviously, you're, you're an entrepreneur. Um, you're managing the, the, the how, do you, how do you say it? The bad... The Bad yeah, Guild, Bad Guild, yes. Bad the, Guild. yes. <laughs> the Black Artists and Designers Guild, the full name, but yes. That's right, that's right. And you're currently in graduate school studying ceramics, is that right? Correct, correct, yeah. A lot that's on my plate, right? A lot on your plate, yeah, but that's, <laughs> hey, busy, busy is definitely good these days. No, um, it is. I guess we should just get into it, and I, and I know that you have a lot of work to share with us, um, both be. your work in carpet design, so coming from a background in textiles and uh, your, your paintings, I guess, early on, and then your yes. work in textiles, and then moving into your work, your current work in ceramics, right? Yeah, I like to give a little context as far as, you know, how, to, how I got to where I am. No, know, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Helpful, right? Okay. Yeah, that's fantastic. So right. I'm going to start. I'm going to share my screen. We're ready? Yeah, we're ready. Please <laughs> All right. So it's going to be me and you, Stephen. So ask away the questions, okay? I'm yeah, we do, we, we do have a live audience in there. Um, you guys should be asking questions in the chat as you feel, uh, as they come up. So we will get to those questions at the end, and uh, hopefully you'll have an opportunity to speak directly to Melanie. Here we go. So can everyone see my screen? You can see it all right? Okay. Perfect. Yeah, that's it. Okay, perfect. So first, I want to say thank you. Um, thank you, Stephen uh, St uh, Friedman Benda for inviting me to share my story. I always look at it as, a, as another blessing, um, opportunities to really speak about my work, where I am with the hopes that it will inspire people. Um, and we'll begin. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, here we go. So, um, so Stephen, you know, I, for, for those who don't know, I, I've been an artist all my life. Um, this is not something that I found as an adult. I've been drawing ever since I was eight years old. Um, these are some of my first paintings. On the left, uh, I, I was a part of an artistically talented program. Um, and we would draw every week and paint. On Wednesday, I remember Wednesday um, uh, afternoons, uh, that was my class. But what's interesting is now that I look back at these paintings, if you could see, I was already signing my name, you know, my Oh, sorry. I was already signing my name. This is the this is the mouse. Sorry, sorry. I was already signing my name, uh, Melanie B. Because we had an op we had a, we only could sign with our first initial and our full last name, or our full full for, full name and our initial for our last name. And it's interesting because later that became the name of my company, Melanie B. I used. But what's also very apparent during this time is that. I was actually painting portraits of my family, but if you notice, the skin tones are nowhere near um, close to, because nowhere near close to who I look like. This was actually a portrait of my cousin on the left, but we weren't allowed to mix any skin tones darker than, um, base, base, basically, darker than a white person. Wow. So if my portraits all back then were all based on, um, direction from the teacher at the time for what a person's supposed to look like based on their skin tone. Huh, that's interesting. I, I actually, my, my first question was, where did your interest in art come from? And uh, 
and I guess it's I, it, it goes all the way back to your childhood and, and this, uh, this issue of identity comes up very early. Yeah, it does. And of course, at eight years old, you know, it's, you're not questioning, questioning it because, you know, the authority is your teacher at the time. And, you know, you're still trying to figure out who you are. And so you're just following directions. And so I was good at following directions. And the, it's, a, it's a small clip on the right side you can't see. But again, it was another um, portrait. Um, again, at the time, I know it was a classmate of mine, a friend, you know, that I was picturing, but I know clearly this picture was my nephew who was living with us at the time. And the K was for his initial on the block as his name was Calfani. Mm. And so, um, but I still have this painting. It's hanging in my mother's home. And are those, uh, are those your little hands on the right? No. <laughs> well, this is grown now. <laughs> this is me as an adult, but finding the, the paintings and, you know, my mother actually kept them. And right. so I was able to go through them, you know, as an adult and look back and think, wow, these are the things that are, you know, that I painted early on. So then did you continue painting into your later years? I did. And so when I got into high school, um, it's funny, Stephen, I was a, my mother was a classical pianist. She's, she came from a, a small island, St. Vincent in the Caribbean. And mm. so when she arrived in the U.S., um, she was a, she studied classical piano. And because of that, uh, later on, she changed her major to education. But because of that, she, she um, made sure that all her daughters, I'm, I'm one of three, we had to play an instrument. And so we had to play piano and we had to play the violin. And I played the violin all the way up until 10th grade because um, it was in 10th grade when I decided to go back to fine art because our, our high school did not allow to have two art majors, which is crazy when you think about it. You had to choose. And so I decided, you know what? I really want to go back to fine art. And so this is a picture. Um, actually, it's funny. I'm painting a self-portrait of myself we had just taken a trip to Barbados. I'd just gone to my mother's home country for the first time, St. Vincent and Grenada. Mm -hmm. And the painting, it's me on the, on the steps at um, Sandy Lane, which is a hotel in Barbados. And uh, my professor, you know, she would always document um, our process. So that's how this portrait came about. So this is you in high school? This is me in high school, yeah. yeah. Did you go on to study art in college? I did. And so from there, um, I, this is actually a self-portrait during my last year of high school, which is actually in the city hall. And it's funny, I look at this portrait, Stephen, because I was doing a double portrait and at the time I didn't wear glasses. And I said, oh, let me add glasses to make myself look different. But now as an adult, I can't see without my glasses. But this actually, this painting actually um, sits in this, my hometown city hall. So it's never actually made it home and it's a part of their permanent collection. Hmm. Was that somehow speaking to having a foot in both identities, the Caribbean and America? And yeah, way? and you know, from this point, because I look back to that early experience of portraits on, you know, the, the early discrimination on how I could portray people, I made sure they only did self-portraits because, mm -hmm. the, you know, you, I couldn't deny, a professor couldn't deny me painting myself as is. So I was very drawn to doing that exclusively. So during that period, when I look at my work from like my senior, junior, sophomore year of high school, there are a lot of self-portraits. And I was, I guess, when I look back, was part of my protest as to depicting, making sure that black people were represented in my work. Hmm. Did you feel like you were protesting? I mean, or, you know, or during my senior year, I'll tell you this, uh, I would say sure, because that's when I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And that's when my awakening happened, yeah. where I started to really um, feel like there was an, a connection and an identity that was forming that was not there prior. You know, of course, I knew I was a black girl at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, I, 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 I knew the basics about, you know, quote unquote, what blackness was, mm -hmm. but I had no connection to a culture that, you know, I, I was still trying to figure out what that was. Of course, I knew bits and pieces from the Caribbean, from my parents, because my father's from Jamaica as well. You know, the cultural things to family, but not really looking at it from that lens at that time. But it was that book that really awakened me to yeah. the struggles, the injustice, the inequities. And that was just the beginning. 
Yeah, yeah, and that's so critically important, the writings of Malcolm X for, for Black Americans, because, I mean, for me, it was the end of white world supremacy, uh, which my uncle gave me. And, uh, and I, you know, never even thought that there was such a thing, right? Because yes. we're all just living and we're all just trying to kind of, you know, be. Uh, and then you're, you're reminded of where you fit uh, yeah. in the culture, in the society, um, in the history. So yeah, really which is true. And you know, it's interesting because now that I look back, Stephen, like where I grew up, grew up in Norwalk, Connecticut, my mother's still in the same house, 48 years, we're still the only black family in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so my social circles from say elementary all the way up to high school were pretty much white females. And, you know, of course, that was my social circle when I went home, who, you know, my neighbors would go over to play. There were certain neighbors we couldn't go into their house. They wouldn't let us into their house. Again, mm -hmm. not knowing all the details of why that was happening, but these were some of the experiences. And I'll even remember, um, Stephen, when I was 10 years old, I played softball. I was a real jock athlete. Yeah. And they could not pronounce my name. So they decided to call me Molly. They changed, they said, no, we're going to call you Molly. <laughs> You're definitely not a Molly, but. <laughs> yeah. And but once my father got, got wind of it, he went on the softball field and said, oh, no, I named, her name is Melanie. And I was actually the first uh, to ha not have a Western name, and it was purposely. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, you know, but again, but just, just the, again, the audacity in the, in the, in the level of, um, privilege that was taken to say, you know what, we're going to name you yeah. based on our own comfort. Yeah. I want to um, just cite one uh, statistic that I came across in preparation for this talk with you, Melania, and, and it's something like 86% of white Americans um, live in nearly completely segregated communities in this country, with only 1% of their communities being people of color. So, you know, your family was that 1%, my family was that 1% growing up. And, yeah. and, and I, you know, you have to wonder, in fact, uh, this gets into your, your Obsidian House, which we'll talk about later, yeah. but uh, something like 70% of uh, African Americans live in cities um, and, and not in a kind of suburban condition. Yeah. So, um, not to get uh, caught in the personal narratives, but Let's, let's continue with the work. For sure, for sure. Now we're in college. You know, I continued my journey of discovering my identity through cultural experiences. Mm -hmm. I was very, um, I took a deeper dive into studying the culture in Ghana, um, mm -hmm. Senegal, Nigeria, various countries in West Africa. And these are just some of the paintings. Actually, the, this, actually this painting on the right was um, the painting that, uh, won me the award for best carpet design and it and it actually the money I used to go to Ghana for huh. the the um, second time actually. Well, I was so, going to ask you have, you, have you traveled throughout Africa? Have you? I've been, yeah, I've been to th uh, three countries, Ghana, Gambia, Senegal, and I've been to Ghana three times and Senegal twice now. Yeah. And uh, it's funny. Um, I had some opportunities to go to some other countries, but you know, I was in love where I was at the moment, so I just stayed longer. And I said, oh, I'll go another time. <laughs> <laughs> but my intention is to travel there more, and travel, of course, is a is a huge source of inspiration for what I do. Sure. One of the things that I want to get into with you is is how uh, those particular cultures and the places that you've been um, have played a direct role in your. Your work sure yeah and this is was this was my first trip to Ghana in 1995 mm -hmm. um, you know here carving wood I learned Stephen ooh, it is hard to carve wood <laughs> 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 I said oh okay I'm gonna leave it to the masters I'm not one right now <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you know getting your hands around the craft is so important to, to understanding how other people um, really control the material and apply the material to their culture, right? Yeah. But, uh, and then, not, but then you also realize how these crafts, so these uh, skills are, it's years of practice. This is not an overnight quote unquote success. This is something that's been passed down. Yeah. So it makes sense exactly. why someone who's just starting it, like, okay, there's some, there's a learning curve here. Yeah. And this is the generational wealth of these people. 
That's right. That's right. And interesting, you know, I'm very enamored with clay back then. And this is, these pictures are from 95 and I wasn't touching clay at that time, but a lot of my photographs were um, of all the different crafts that were being made in Ghana. So did you have the opportunity to play with uh, ceramics when you were there? Not, in, not during this trip, but later on, um, I went back like last year to actually work in clay alongside with the Ewe women. And on the right, this picture is actually Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana. This is his memorial. Mm. Um, so that was an amazing um, experience to see that for the first time. I mean, it's only a clip, so if you definitely you should Google it and um, look it up because it is... Um, it's a quite uh, elaborate memorial. Have you been there, Stephen? I've been to Ghana, yeah. I was in Accra uh, with, uh, what was it, Design Network Africa. Uh, okay. A, a foundation from the Netherlands that was uh, supporting craft in Ghana. Um, I don't remember what year. I think it was, it must have been around 2008, 2009. Okay, okay. More recent. And so then when I came back from um, doing all these travels, I, and this is a picture of my friend's mother in Senegal. I wanted to make sure that my work really reflected these experiences. So when I started my carpet design business in 2009, I decided that I wanted this global experience and I started to create carpets reflecting that. And these are some of my first um, carpet designs. This was Wolof, you know, mm -hmm. looking at the fashions um, of the Wolof people, then um, I had traveled to India to my girlfriend's wedding, and these are my hands from the Mendy ceremony. Mm. And then I created this carpet called Mendy. Um, and then I was looking at the techniques of the Aborigines art. Um, I really was focused on process and how things were made. That's what, that's what was important to me. And then how would I apply that with these different materials and in, in this medium? Were you working in Australia at all? No, I have yet to go. Um, it is on my list, um, but no. So I, I, I basically was, you know, studying their techniques and the meanings behind their paintings and, you know, having a better understanding there. Yeah, so I, I guess one of the questions that uh, I was hoping we could touch upon is this idea of appropriation. Um, I myself have been accused of appropriation uh, at times and from a younger generation um, of, <laughs> believe it or not, black designers here in America. And, uh, and I, I struggled with that because, I mean, from my perspective, all of the work uh, that I've done, I've done with communities and I, and I wasn't um, in any way uh, outside of that community borrowing their, you know, vocabulary or visual language. Um, and, and still, you know, it's this question of how do we, uh, as African Americans, find space to define a culture that is um, outside of a kind of Western exclusive perspective, right, in design, uh, without, uh, I guess, crossing these lines of what could be construed or misconstrued as appropriation. So have you, have you dealt with any topics like that in your work? Well, not with my work personally, but I've dealt with the topic as a conversation, but this is my th theory. If I'm Black, there is no appropriation when I'm working with Black principles and working with the materials and processes of my community. Whether it's from Senegal, whether it's from um, Jamaica, whether, you know, as long as it's connected to Black people, because of our diaspora experience, right. we have every right to claim what is ours. Mm -hmm. It has not been given to us, it's been erased. And so for us to go say to Senegal, Ghana or wherever to connect with our community, that is, that is uh, we, what we're doing is one, we're um, reaffirming our identity and then we're also trying to carry on with the legacy based yeah. on our experience of through colonization and being in the Western society. Yeah, so of course. My, my thing is that we're not appropriating. Appropriating comes from the reason why we even discuss appropriation, I think, is because of the capitalism of this country and the world. Mm. You know, that's when it becomes appropriating. And we're only just navigating what we've been born into. So, so I mean, the, the, the question of how we use the visual language of the diaspora right and and how we apply that for you is one 
more about uh, connecting to our own um, inherent culture and legacy. Right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I think because we've been fed these uh, Eurocentric centered education, as far as what design is, what craft is, what art is, then that's where this level of quote unquote appropriation comes in because we haven't been in spaces where we're able to even learn about our own culture. So mm. what we're, we're doing is we're, we're going beyond the, you know, education that we've been given and saying, wait, there's, there's so much more. How do, where, do, where do I carve out my space? And this is how I do it. Of okay. course, European designers and artists have been appropriating cultures all over the world for <laughs> generations, right? Exactly. But, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, when we think about it, Stephen, how did colonialism start it? They, they, they went around the world and made up these countries and created borders and he created all these visual systems for us to follow. Mm -hmm. So the appropriation is not on us. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, you've talked about trying to decolonize uh, uh, the language of design right? yeah. for another generation. And, and I want to get into that, but let's continue sure. to get more of your work. Sure. Oh, sorry. So, um, and I, I, I bring this picture up because, you know, when I was starting the business in 09, you know, the work that I was doing was very different. You know, thinking about rugs from a perspective globally and being very specific onto the sources. And this was my first article. Um, I met Cindy Allen, the editor in chief of Interior Design Magazine. Yeah. And, you know, to have this felt like, oh my gosh, okay, I have something, right? And so the momentum started there and the carpet designs have evolved. And so this is more of the work that I'm doing now. Um, I'm still working with uh, weavers in Nepal, doing hand knotted, handmade um, rugs, custom working with interior designers. Well, tell us a little bit about that. How intentional were you about starting your own company? And, and uh, or was it something that kind of happened? Um, and then how did you set up these sources for production? Yeah, it was very intentional, Stephen. Um, I worked in the industry working for rug manufacturers and textile manufacturers for 10 years. And so I had studied the industry, learned the distribution, and I knew I had my own voice because the work I was doing for those manufacturers didn't speak to my soul. Listen, I was designing the best Christmas rugs, the best rooster rugs, okay? <laughs> I, you know, I'm not mad at the experience, but that's what I was doing. But you know, as an artist, when you have a, a voice, you want it to be heard. And I knew I had to create my own space so my voice could be heard. But it's interesting, that was the intention. And what happened um, was that towards the, my voice wasn't heard and I'll explain why, because I was in the industry of um, working for interior designers and it was more about their voice being heard. And right. you, you were being commissioned by interior designers to execute their designs. That's right. Okay. Even though I had a collection of uh, portfolio of different designs, it became more of a customization of, oh, this is what I'm looking for. Um, can you make this pattern? Of course I could make it because I'm an artist, so I could, you know, make whatever. And I was doing it and I was doing it well um, for many years. And to, uh, to answer your question on the sourcing, you know, I signed up with um, Goodweave, uh, which is that the organization that certifies that the carpets are made child labor free. And they were able to provide um, resources for manufacturers. And then, you know, once you um, start making, you know, word gets around and there's the internet and social media, different vet, uh, manufacturers start to contact you. But that is how I started it. And um, these are some of the projects um, that I've completed over the years. So, so as I mean, I know that um, there are very few black women in this in this space. Yes. Um, and I'm, I guess, I'm curious in in which ways did you find uh, did you feel any pushback or or resistance? I guess to your efforts trying to kind of communicate with a new voice. Very much so. Um, in the beginning, um, to be frank, I had a business partner, male, white male. It didn't work out. And I remember going to meetings, they always thought he was the owner, <laughs> even though it's my name on the company, you know, <laughs> like, right. hello. Right. But that was um, the obvious. Um, and, you know, I realized that there was, it was a twofold thing, Stephen. Either you're gonna know me, be, meaning you're gonna remember me because I am the only black woman. And mm -hmm. plus 
my name is, is unique. And so either you're going to remember me or not. So I use that to my advantage. Mm -hmm. um, and so I networked like crazy. I was out at every event. I knew all the designs. I read the magazines, you know. I had to do a really grassroots because if we think when I started this in 2009, the economy was really down. Yeah. Sure. Right. So it was like, okay, work with what you have. And that's, you know, that is one of the tools. Um, and I'll, I'll generalize that black people we've had to do work with what you have, make something from whatever it is that you have. And that's what it I was doing. Nothing for most of right. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, no publicist, you know, I couldn't do any of that. Mm -hmm. I was out there, um, but I knew I had, an, I, I knew my story was unique to me and I knew I had something to say and I believed in what I was doing. Um, it, it was very hard um, because I always knew that I didn't get the big projects that some of my counterparts were getting. I always knew that. And in fact, it's a huge industry and there's huge. even in, even in difficult times, right? The, the wealthier redecorating and, and, uh, you know, in fact, there's room for everyone and for a multitude of voices. And, and I think what, what's really interesting for me is how, how difficult it is for people to kind of be accepting of that kind of plurality and to create space for, uh, for the African-American voice in design. Yeah, yeah. And, and luckily that's changing. Um, let's continue. Sure. And these are, again, some more projects, um, you know, work with some big names, like we see Viacom to um, private residences, mm -hmm. all custom um, handmade carpets. And then I start to venture into other product categories, because again, I didn't want to just be known for just rugs. I was a designer, you know, Stephen, yeah. we, we have these interests. And so, you know, I always had this interest in doing a wallpaper um, reflecting the market scenes that mm -hmm. I visited, whether it was in West Africa or the Caribbean. You know, market is a central place for entrepreneurship for women. And so this was one of the patterns that I created. And then I went into tiles, doing cement tiles. This was actually all looking at my mother's home country in St. Vincent. It was called Scion Hill. It was a street that she grew up on. And so, you know, and it was exciting to do. And then there were, I, there were collaborations with Kravit and, you know, Swell and, and the MTA. So things were going really well, you know, yeah. and then. What, what year was oh, that, let's say? I'm sorry, which, for this right here? Yeah, let's say, when, when did this transition occur for you? All of this was in, uh, I, this was around two, uh, 20, let me see, 2017, 2016, 2017. A few years ago. Yeah, it's very, very recent. But it was in 20... Um, 18 is when I decided to reposition and I took a sabbatical from the rug business. Mm -hmm. I decided I was no longer going to be making rugs the way I was doing it um, based on um, the voice of the client. I so wanted, did, you, did you have employees at this time or was there I, in the, terms the, of... No. Know? Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm like, Steven, come on. You know was, how we roll. Listen, we grassroots now. It was, <laughs> Me, it was, myself, it, and I. <laughs> so a personal decision, close the door and move on for a minute, huh? I, yeah. get it, I, get it. I mean, listen, I've never had like a full-time employee. I've always had like contractors for different things, mm -hmm. you know, but no, never full-time. Um, and had you ever gotten any attention for your artwork, for your paintings? Because I'm looking at... Uh, well, what's here. interesting is when I first went to college, it was for painting, right? Mm -hmm. When I first went to college. Then I transferred to FIT to do fashion illustration and textile design. And that's where I graduated from. And I had hired a um, branding consultant to help me figure out what's my next move. Because I said, listen, I don't want to do rugs anymore. And she came back and said, well, Melania, you're an artist. And I said, well, I know that. <laughs> but she's like, no, you need to get back and doing your art and start mm -hmm. drawing again. And I was like, what, really? And I said, okay, I asked for guidance. And so I'm the type of person, hey, if I ask and I, for guidance, I listen. So I started to, I said, let me just go back to doing the, using the materials that I love, which was pastel at the time and acrylic mm -hmm. paint. And I, even my high school art teacher who took that picture of me in the beginning, yeah. I called her. She still lives in my hometown. <laughs> I called, she's good friends with my mother. So I called her and said, you know, Mary, I'm ready to go back to art. She says, okay, I'll take you to the art store. And she did. Wow. And so, wow. so I guess, 
I guess I'm wondering though how this, it, it seems like um, how your interest in art and your passion for art continues to find a voice in the applied arts and design. So I'm, I'm wondering what is it about design that's attracting you, whether it be the carpets or, you know, we'll talk about the ceramics. What is it about design that that pulled you f away from, uh, let's say, the fine arts? Well, at the time, we're thinking 1990s, and it was, ab it was about galleries and trying to sell a painting, and I didn't want to get into that model of, make, of making money. I wanted to make money, so I thought design was the way. Right, you know, more, more of an entrepreneurial space. Exactly, thinking about multiples, you know, more people could have it. You mm -hmm. know, there was no internet or social media at the time when I was in college, so, that, you know, so it was either go back to doing, you know, go, go down the route of painting or, you know, fine art, whichever medium I chose, or think about more of a commercial type of art, which was design. Sure, sure. You understand. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 won't, I won't get into my story, but yeah. I, I, kind of, I kind of always knew it was design, even though I was trying at an early age to tell us about the reposition. So then, as it, as it, so I started to paint, right? And these paintings were the first ones. And I was looking at things. I was looking at market women. Again, it was a series of market women. And uh, they're mixed media, actually. It's hard to tell, but there is like craft paper there. There's this um, acrylic, so it, and it, but it's pastel painted on the surface. Mm. And then I started, then I decided you know, I know painting and drawing, but I want to experience a new medium. And so I decided, you know, I've always been interested in clay, so why not try it? And I was encouraged to take a class, you know, in the local studio. And honestly, I didn't like it. <laughs> the first class I took was slip casting and making molds. And I said, uh, yeah. what did I do? <laughs> yeah, you, you really have to be uh, sure about what you're making. It's true. <laughs> but uh, my professor- sure, uh, Experimentation. Yeah, the teacher said, you know, I think you'd like hand building. And so I said, okay, let me try. And so I did. I enrolled in another class in another studio, and I started hand building. And these are some of the first pieces that I created. But I wanted to see how I could connect my love of pattern and textile, making a pattern in the clay. And mm -hmm. so these were the first attempts at adding that patterning to clay. So let's talk about the pattern language here. What what do you what inspiration are you drawing upon here? And had you relocated to Philly at this time? No, this is all still in Brooklyn. Okay. This is all still in Brooklyn. Um, it was interesting. I was going back to different techniques, like when we think about the Aborigine and the dots, and mm -hmm. I was thinking about you know this is called an inlay technique, and again, I wanted to look at that and how I could, you know, um, apply that to a surface in, in clay. So that's really what I was looking at um, in reference. And this is more design, you know, pattern design in a sense, not thinking about, oh, do these patterns really mean anything? It wasn't about, this is strictly about the process and techniques just to see how this material works. Mm -hmm. And from there, um, and from there it grew into me taking a deeper dive, going back to my first years of college and thinking about the artists who always inspired me. Hmm. And it was Edmonia Lewis, Elizabeth Catlin, Augusta Savage. They were all sculptors in their own right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I wanted to follow in their footsteps. And, you know, and so what happened was I decided to look deeper in, back into um, the life of Edmonia Lewis. And she, you know, she was kicked out of college at Oberlin, you know, back, this is in the 1800s. And, and she went to Italy. She left the country and went to Pietro Santo, Italy to study marble carving. Now, mm -hmm. mind you, I was not going to do that, but, <laughs> <laughs> but well, what I did. <laughs> it's, very, it's very powerful, though, that you recognize that you're, you have a place in the lineage of artists that have come before you. Yes. And, and I think that that, you know, we as African Americans have to find those kinds of traditions and build upon them, right? Yes. It's, it's not always about inventing from zero because, in fact, barely anything comes from nothing, right? So right. regardless of who you are, what medium you're working in, you're always in one way or another building upon who came before. And I think to make a conscious decision about who those inspirations should be and what they represented 
and and say to yourself, I you know I appreciate I honor this legacy by by trying to continue in the footsteps of these great people. I think that that's a very powerful move. And so that move took brought me to Italy. And so you um, did go to Italy. I did <laughs> not to do marble carving, okay, okay. figurative sculpture. Beautiful. Wow. I was, I was very, I, I figured I'd never sculpted a figure before, but I. <laughs> that, I that smile on your face that says, I'm living the dream. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so, you know, to come out with a piece that, you know, resembled a, a human in some form, it wasn't about replicating perfectly, but it was like, is the, is the essence of a human being there? And so for the first time, sculpting i was so excited and then so know, were you in were you in florence can you can you No, talk? i was in pietra santa i went right where monia went at wow. pietra santa italy can you and put the name of the school for our listeners in the chat sure it's called sculpt italy oh well that's easy it's easy yeah <laughs> um, i think or i think i or you know i might i think they changed their name to be honest but the professors are based in vancouver i think mm -hmm. it's i i can sculpt in italy something like that Mm. But they're still, they're actually enrollment for the next one is coming. Hopefully it'll happen for summer. So what, what was it about being in Italy uh, that, um, I guess, contributed to your experience here? What, what was it about the culture of Italy? Why did you need to go to Italy to sculpt these figures? You know, again, it was a more about following the footsteps of Edmonia, of the ancestors, and knowing that she never finished what she was capable of doing. Mm. And, you know, wanting to capture that the same knowledge or experience in some some sense even though it wasn't the same material and then taking that information and experience and again apply it to my practice for how it would work for me and that's how i felt again honoring the ancestors as and then well as you know continuing with um the legacy that you know i was already building and then after when I came back from Italy, I had a residency at Greenwich House Pottery. So this is where I truly made the pivot and realized that clay is something that I want to take a deeper dive. I spent three months there working on a collection of 25 vessels focused on uh, uh, the techniques used to do make, um, uh, 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 sorry, the techniques for um, surface design and mud architecture in Mali, Burkina Faso, Nigeria. Oh. And from there, I, st I created these vessels. So the vessels on the left um, were looking at the techniques the women were using to apply on their homes. And then I was using those techniques in whether it was slip, which is a liquid clay, or um, as you'll see, well, I haven't, you know, I haven't seen these in person, but yeah. I have to say that they are immediately architectural. And there's something about, um, obviously, it is about the way that it's built, as if, as if one layer is kind of laid on top of the other, on top of the, the other, et cetera. And your, the relationship to architecture is, is, uh, is very intriguing. Um, the question I had when I saw these was, how do you, uh, I guess, transfer the meaning um, of the, you know, what was ornament on the house and what probably had symbolic meaning to these people onto these vessels. How does that, how does that carry forward? Well, I think, um, you know, it, it, you know, it's funny because I've, I've had struggle with trying to say like, oh, this actually means X, Y, and Z, right? And and this is where I'm, this is what one of the things that I'm working on currently in school is making that connection because, you know, see then for the past 20 something years, I've been so focused on creating design, creating design, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I remember initially when I started presenting my work and talking about the meaning, nobody wanted to hear it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, How much is it going to cost and what's the materials and when can I get it? Right. So I, I kind of like threw away some of that language. Mm -hmm. which is something that I'm working towards bringing it back into my work because it really is important to me. And, you know, I, this is the beginning of me really just trying to get out ideas, concept processes that had been burning inside of me for so long. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it was more about connecting with ancestors through process more so than identifying say meaning of particular patterns. Yeah, so that, sure. That and, was and 
I mean, I don't know if anyone's told you this, but abstraction is okay. <laughs> yes, no, it is. As you listen, as you can see on the right, I mean, this is what you know we've been doing for so long. Uh, you have a right. You have a right. To <laughs> yes. So, and then I was looking at how the architecture um, from Nigeria, the techniques as well, and the vessel on the left was reflecting um, those techniques. What I mean, what specifically about the architecture in Nigeria is inspiring this piece? It's a sculptural element of, you know, honestly, this is my dream to have a home like this with pattern and sculptural elements on the exterior. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to have a space where you're like, oh, where do you live? You know that house with the patterns and the sculpture or it's turquoise? Like uh -huh. that is my kind of space. And so the boldness of putting that on the exterior, because we're so used to having to be invited to someone's home to kind of see how they're living yeah. or experience space. But I think space could be experienced on the exterior as well. So do you know what uh, particular tribe this was made from? Or the Hausa, Hausa. The Hausa tribe. So yeah. what, what year would that house have been made? You know, I'm not sure of the year, to be honest. Um, I'm not sure of the year. This this is where, you know, for me, this question of, uh, you know, how we as African-Americans relate to Africa can become very tricky. I know that uh, just to reference uh, the film that was so inspirational for a lot of people recently, uh, Black Panther, right? Um, when we, the criticism of that film was sort of about how, uh, you know, the set uh, designer borrowed the production designer borrowed so much abstractly from Africa and mashed all these cultures together yeah. without at all sort of uh, considering their meaning for Africans. Yes. And, and so, you know, as we, um, it feels like uh, as, as we as a culture begin to move into deeper into design and begin to kind of define what is the design of black design, right? Yeah. Yes. Talk about what is black space. Um, yes. Are these spaces safe in terms of our identity and our culture? What mm -hmm. is black design? As we begin to kind of define what that is, mm -hmm. uh, the, the question becomes how much can we borrow from the motherland, quote unquote, and, and, and how much do we do um, the kind of due diligence of, of communicating the meaning and value for those people? And is that necessary, right? And, and it's, it's a very complex uh, series of, I'm not saying that you can answer them. <laughs> no, no, these are things that I think about. Um, and, you know, it's interesting because I'm doing a lot of studies right now on colonial visual systems, specifically focused on the Caribbean mm -hmm. and really understanding this whole process, process of um, colonialism through the Atlantic slave trade and really understanding that, you know, once we were captive and on that ship, everything was stripped. And the intention was to strip everything, literally down to your clothes, take away the culture, everything, name, language, families, everything, right? right? And so then you think about it, we, we're, we're on this new piece of land, right? And we're, again, we're, we have to figure out how we're gonna, it's all about survival at this point, right? But it's interesting that even though that was the intention, you know, we could still go down south, go to the Caribbean, go to South America, and we still see the traces of the culture. Well, but for many of us, um, right, we can't at all trace our heritage, right? I mean, apart from uh, the Southern roots, let's say for my family and for many of us, mm -hmm. in your case, you have the Caribbean roots, which you can directly trace, right? So uh, to a certain extent, so, so it's, it, you know, some, some might argue that uh, obviously if you were re re seeking to represent a culture, it could be that Caribbean culture quite directly. Yes. But, but to reach to Nigeria and say this particular house, I guess the, it, it becomes a question of why this house and what does this mean to you um, well, outside of its abstraction. Well, you know, I, I beg to differ because I think whether we're born in the South or the Caribbean, we can trace. 
you know, I recently did a DNA test just to give a, a sense of uh, region. I may not say exactly. I can't say exactly which group. Okay? I'm really curious about that. I haven't talked to anyone who's done yeah, that. Yeah, I've done. And, that, and actually, that's what I'm using for the beginnings of my research. Mm. The work that I'm doing now is that I'm going back to the region and understanding the paths of the slave trade because if you look at the countries and the areas where we were taken and then the paths of where we and so for example for me bright um the whole west central african coast right for me nigeria was the was the, the highest in my dna okay uh -huh. and so and then there was um benin ghana togo um you know and then it had jamaica on there too now Incredible. Jamaica, when we any look surprises? At any surprises that you were? No, 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 no surprises. No surprises. <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, I ain't got that. I got like 1% European in me. That's you're, you're not also Indonesian or anything? <laughs> nope, no, no, <laughs> no. So, uh, but I tell you, when we understand the past, right? So, for example, the Congo area was a big um, area where a lot of um, captives were taken. Right, and so where were they brought first? Lot yeah. were brought to Jamaica. Jamaica was a huge port, and so was Barbados during that time, and Cuba. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, I'm looking at that path first, right? Because again, we did not come to this part of the world on our own. Of so course. You no, no, I mean, I, so, no. So, but I'm saying we have to understand the past, so so that will help us to inform how we could talk about you know, the roots and heritage. And, you know, recently I was just reading um, Flash of the Spear. Have you read that book? Uh, I haven't, no. Robert Ferris Thomas, uh, Thompson. And again, he's talking about the, the African origins in, in our, whether in, in the South or in the Caribbean. And specifically in the South, you know, things like bottle trees and looking at the, con the um, cosmograms from the Congo through religious, mm -hmm. spiritual practices. Mm -hmm. now, I rather not say religion; it's more spiritual because yeah. our practice is spiritual. Yeah, it's not and indoctrinated in a Western sense. No, because yeah. that is how. <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. Yeah, too. yeah. But the spirit. The, but the spirit. If we and again, this was just one, one area that where we could still see the prevalence and the connection to the continent is spirituality mm -hmm. from how we bury the dead, from how we. Um, things that we did to wear off the, to um, wear off the spirits. Hmm. That's not, that's not Southern. And see, no, absolutely. Right? And it, you know, I would, I, I think it's very interesting that uh, vessels are such a part of your creative vocabulary because vessels obviously are um, symbolic objects when it comes to spirituality and, and, yes. uh, and are, um, I guess, indicative of all of the cultures. Uh, that you're mentioning so yeah uh, they carry you know, a lot we're we're getting into some really good conversation with <laughs> lady I, and i know you got like, you got a thousand more all right i'm gonna go i'm gonna go move it <laughs> I'm this one is incredible yeah <laughs> tell us a little bit about this house well um you know the area in um Bur uh, burkina faso ghana it's called Kasena, the area hmm. so again it's all taken from how the women specifically decorate their homes. And you know, these, these patterns, you know, again, they have to be reapplied because it's not permanent, you know, using the natural earth materials to create this. So the men would build the houses and then the women would decorate. But it's interesting even, you know, these homes are not about, they're based for shelter, you know? And you notice the doorways are very low. They did that on purpose to keep away the enemies. So mm -hmm. they're the only ones who could know how to, be safe in their own home if you you know and it's interesting that's a whole nother conversation about you mm -hmm. know black bodies being safe in their own home now mm -hmm. um but this was part of the architecture mm -hmm. and there's something about scarification right on the on yeah the there is there is so um, they're almost like pictograms oh, right yeah yeah and actually this one is the you know the looking at the moko jumbies, uh, this is part of carnival traditions, and actually, the moko jumbies were to ward off those evil spirits. Um, mm -hmm. in Trinidad, I'm specifically talking about, um, but this is the vessel that I created on the left, 
And it's interesting because, you know, some of these vessels, to be honest, Stephen, like I created them and then it, it, I saw how it connected to different cultural um, icons or experiences. So and, tell, us, tell us, I mean, let's, let's get into your process a bit. How do you begin a work like this? Are you beginning with the reference images and the research and then exploring or do you have a sense of form in mind and then uh, it's really the, the surface? What is your process like in making Well, I'll tell you, with this residency, it was a combination of beginning with research, then just allowing myself to just go and be without connected to any research, and then building, allowing the clay to do what it wants to do, because clay has its own personality that, you know, people may not think. And you may want it to do something, but it's like, nope. We're not going there today. So, you know, so you have, it's like a dance. And so that's why each piece I do is unique and it's one of a kind. Um, and then what happened was once I was finished, then I saw like the clay become something else. And then it may have reminded me of something that I didn't necessarily have in the beginning of my research. So then I'll go back and find it. Melanie, if you don't mind, I'd love to jump ahead to your sure. current work uh, yeah. in the, uh, in graduate school and how you Oh, talk. yes. We have to talk about Obsidian. Okay, we gotta wait. Talk, we got to talk, talk about, about the guild. We okay, just, listen, so, we just be quick with the guild. Well, well, wait, we have to talk, okay, so we'll, we'll talk about the guild and we'll talk about Obsidian all at once. Yes, wants. exactly. So the Black Arts and Designers Guild, this is where we've created our own space um, mm -hmm. to be in this industry. We understand that um, the industry has done a has failed to create space for Black voices, Black talent, and this is what the guild is about. Our and what prompted the founding of the guild? Well, it prompted a lot. Being in this industry and understanding that um, I was tired of not seeing uh, re us represented, whether it was through magazines, through panels, and of course it was an event that really got to me. And I was on my sabbatical, so I was able to look at the industry from a different set of eyes. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I did a post on social. Use what, I used what I had to voice my opinion. So speaking of representation, let's go back to that image of you and uh, your team there or your, your, your collaborators. Let some of the members. <laughs> Let some of the members. So, so are these founding members? Is there a committee? Um, and, and, and can you name all of them for us? Uh, in the picture, we have Jomo Tariku, furniture designer, Sheila Bridges, interior designer, Lisa Hunt, artist, Raymond Boozer, interior designer, Joy Moiler, interior designer, me, Layden Lewis, interior designer, architect, curator. Right, right. <laughs> And this is just, these are just a few of the members. We represent six different disciplines related to the home um, design trade mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to create more visibility, equity, and an opportunity for us to define what we're talking about. What is our Black aesthetic? What does Black design mean to us, our cultural narrative, and honor our ancestry? Yeah. And so one of the exciting ways that you're doing that is this collaboration with Hearst Magazines, right? So please... Well, um, Hearst, Hearst is our media sponsor, and what we've done is during COVID, like everybody else, meeting on Zoom, we decided to come up with our own um, initiative, which is our creative incubator. It allows us to be creative thinkers and collaborate together on our own projects. And so Obsidian is a virtual um, concept house, not a show house, concept house, where we are um, exploring the future dwelling of Black families. Mm. During COVID, after COVID, what would space feel like? And it's set in the year 2025 in Oakland Hills. Uh, two of our architects have designed the space and then a, com a collaboration between interior designers and makers have designed the interiors. Uh, who are the architects? So Layden Lewis and uh, Nina Cook-John are the architects and we'll be announcing the, uh, the creators in another week. So I can't talk about that right now. Okay, okay. <laughs> So one of the questions that I had goes back to the statistic that I mentioned about 7% yes. of African Americans living in cities. And I'm curious why in this image there's a kind of aspiration for um, country or suburban living. Yes, and it's so interesting. I'm glad you picked up on that because this is aspirational. And that's what we were thinking for um, the Black community to bring back that sense of aspiration in living. And the idea- why the, why the suburbs as opposed because to- Because going back, going back historically, culturally, we, we grew up in, a, in an environment where there was space and we were with the land. And that, that is a very important part to us culturally. We've been practicing sustainability before the word became a trend. And so we were, to, our, our purpose is bringing back those elements back into our home environment and making it part of our everyday life because for so long it's been taken away. 
So is there a landscape architect part yes. of the team or? There is a landscape, yes. And that's actually so funny. I was just looking at it the other day. So yeah, there's, there's, a, there's, even, um, there's even a site for, um, for spirituality to worship because we thought about, again, these, what if COVID, COVID happens again? What are we gonna do? We should be sustainable within our own space, space to work out, place to do our hair. Like we thought about all the different cultural and plus we did research with this, um, Stephen, where we interviewed black families and mm. we had surveys. So this is not just based on us thinking and not really connecting with the community. Well, it's really, I, I think it's, it's really exciting, but it's also very challenging for me because as we begin to define um, what is a black house, you know, as, as we begin to, uh, to apply identity to architecture or identity to products, um, the challenge for me is how can we be inclusive without being exclusive? Uh, in terms of uh, a diversity of ways of living, right? Yes. I mean, we all understand that uh, African American culture is not monolithic. Black That's culture right. is not monolithic. That's right. But at the same time, uh, and of course we want to have our voice, but at the same time, you know, you want to define in a sense through this house, how a black family would want to live in the future. And so yes. there's, there's, I think there's, a, there's some friction there between how you um, create an identity for, uh, let's say, Black architecture or a Black design built environment, mm -hmm. while at the same time uh, leaving room for a multitude of voices. Well, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we made sure that we addressed that this home is about the multi-generational living and the multiplicities of Black families. We are not thinking about the nuclear family at all because that does not appeal to us, apply to us, to be honest. And even the idea of, you know, our, fa our black family experience compared to our white counterparts is very different, mm -hmm. you know? And again, this is part of my research, you know, thinking about it through the Atlantic slave trade of how all of those rights were taken away and how we've had to recreate it. Um, and so we're hoping, and this is what we're doing, is addressing those, the multiplicity, of our, our family life stru structure and you know really having in-depth conversations about that because are you saying that from a generational perspective you'll try to represent the diversity of what is the oh generational um the makeup you know we're exploring sexuality you know this is not about husband wife two kids mm -hmm. you know we're not this is nowhere each each actually each creator has come up with their own family and so that's why we're, we're telling the stories from so many different point of views that it's not just one lens. So then does this house have a unique visual language for the architects that are designing it? Or is it, is it somehow building upon their own sort of pre-existing strategies? No, it, it has its own language, actually. It does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, that, and the rollout will be, we'll, we'll, we'll be sharing more about that in January when this will launch online in a total immersive experience. Well, as, as a product designer, as an industrial designer, I'm hoping that the interior <laughs> and the interior objects also do some work, also do some heavy work. Oh, lifting. yes, there, there's some, everything we, we thought about, this is a custom thing. This is not about just specifying the wallpaper, specifying, it's a really custom design based on the family and what the possibilities are for that space. So, Melanie, I, as, as, as could be expected, we're running out of time. I would love to just okay. have this, one this minute, if you have one minute to share I'm your, going through. your current projects. Yes, that was Ghana. Thank you. So that brought me to here. And I, you know, work. Uh, from that, yeah, please. Let's take it from here. Okay. That, well, that image of you building, in fact. Sure. So I, I again, I, I started, I got a studio in Brooklyn. This is when I was in Brooklyn and I decided to start building based on the signifier of the head wrap. And I was looking at the Adore textiles from Nigeria, which is an indigo resist um, dyed textile. And I started to create vessels to mimic the idea of using clay and fabric and what that could signify. Mm. Um, and, and so- and you're bringing in uh, the figurative as well, which I yes, think. Yes, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. And I'll be honest, that came after. The idea was really about the vessel and what the vessel could hold. And then adding the figurative element um, gave a different life to the pieces. And um, even bringing in elements for items that are put in 
to the clay, like these niches, that is all clay, by the way, but it's just glazed with a metallic finish. Mm -hmm. So the idea of um, being seen um, or, or being watched, so depending on who is, um, you know, experiencing it, the feeling would change, so. And I get the impression the scale is very important here. Yes, and these are small pieces, just so you know. They are small pieces, meaning up to like 22 inches high. They're not large at all. Mm -hmm. um, but this is the beginnings of me, you know, taking a deeper dive into the medium, um, investigating how pattern could be used to engage in conversations around Black culture and how to add more meaning to the pattern. This is just the beginning of it. And that's where... Um, again, this is a, another, this is actually a black clay and they're all hand built, all hand carved. The patterns are all one of a kind. Mm. Um, and again, com combining the different um, techniques in this vessel and it feels like a body is in there being held and wrapped. Yeah, um, what is, uh, what's happening in that detail on the right? So that it also again is a uh, clay, which is um, glazed in a metallic finish. Mm. So, so how much how much longer are you in school? And then we're gonna have to open it up for questions. When, no problem. When does I, this when does this work make it out into the world? Oh uh, well, this work. <laughs> I'm in, I have I'm in a two year program, so 22. Okay. But this is this is the work I did before school, and I'll just show you quickly that you know again I'll just these are some of the other vessels and where I am in school. This is my studio where I am now. This mm -hmm. is a week inside. I've been thinking about a world without the restrictions of colonialism. What can yeah. I create? And these are some of the things that I've been thinking about. I, as I said earlier, I've been doing research on the um, Atlantic slave trade and understanding the past and the journey of where the ships and the amount of people that were captive and doing more work going into my family. This is four generations of women who have been leaders and I'm trying to understand the migration patterns of black women, specifically single black women, and how that um, their, their, um, their mobility has helped to influence and change um, societies. So I started to do different testing, mm -hmm. a lot of testing in the studio with different clays and different techniques. So building and, on what you had already begun. Yes, and it's interesting. So with these tests, what has happened, I started to draw again. And mm -hmm. so I started to sketch out um, the different vessels and thinking about what I could put on the inside and what these vessels can hold, mm -hmm. which I'm still investigating. And again, trying to see what it would be like with these figurative ele elements or not. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to end with a, a happy picture of <laughs> hoping we could travel again. This is in Senegal, my last trip. I was there in January. Beautiful. And uh, early this year. And um, so now we can talk about questions. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Melanie. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your work with us. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Um, so now looking out into our live chat, um, collecting a few questions. I'm hoping everyone is still with us. Uh, I know we went over a few minutes. Um, I want to see where we begin. Um, let's see. Uh, Lucy, can you forward me any questions that might be further up in the chat? Um, we're going to ask a question. It looks like Sana Musa. Oh, hey, Sana. <laughs> <laughs> Sana is a friend of yours. Sana, Sana wants to know. Well, I think Sana had a, had several questions. Um, she wondered um, if <laughs> there's a relationship. <laughs> Sana, please. Do you, you want to you want to ask your questions directly? Oh, I have thousands of questions. I don't know which one now. <laughs> Okay, just just one, just one, please. Well, so first of all, I want to say how incredibly impressed I am with this presentation. Oh, thank you. I wish that I could bring you right to my Hunter College students so they could meet you. Oh. It's just incredibly wonderful, thorough, sensitive, business and creative weaved into one. And I think it's really, really, really wonderful. Really wonderful. And you're at a good place, Roberto, Lugo, yes. and Molly Sandler, yes, one of my best friends. And so you're in a wonderful place. I was there last year giving a talk. So let me see, what could be a question? Uh, you have to ask a question now. I know, I don't know what to you ask now. So you mentioned Theaster Gates, and I know Theaster. Oh, yes, yes, yes. As you were talking about this, this, future, this house, it looked futuristic to me. Yeah. Um, um, I just wondered, looking at it and uh, city dwellers living there, and some things came to mind. First of all, will it be affordable? Will this be something that's affordable for 
everyone. I find so many times, not so, not you, but so many times as, as designers, we're designing from an uh, Afrocentric center, but the economics is not Afrocentric. <laughs> we can't have what the Black designers are designing because of the yeah. price range. Yeah. So I mean, I'm just wondering, is this affordable? I'll be um, honest. You also made it the Astro Gates and what he's doing, that's all. No, but, no, no. I, listen, it's funny because that was the initial um, strategy behind this. And then it became bigger and bigger and bigger. And it no, it's it's not affordable. You know, it I'll be honest with you, it's not. I mean, you know, that's one of the things that we're always up against when we're trying to be as creative as we want to be and living in this capitalistic environment. Yeah, um, it's, it's a balance yeah. between, I suppose, aspiration and reality, right? Which is yep. which is linked to my question about many of us living in cities and obviously having one-tenth the wealth of white Americans. Um, let's move on to another question. Thank you so much, Sana. That was wonderful. Uh, it looks like, let me see. I got five messages down here. Uh, okay. So, Sebastian Peter. Sebastian, are you there? Uh, actually, he wants to know about your logo. So maybe. <laughs> oh, um, can, can, Candor Branding did my logo. Brand. Yeah, Candor branding. Yeah, can I can put it in the chat. Okay. Lovely. Okay. Lovely. And then maybe the name of the architects could also go in the chat oh, yeah. uh, of the Obsidian House. So well, you could go down. to here. I'm going to put the website where you could go to and. Um, One question that I had for you, Melanie, before we yeah. wrap it up, because we're way mm -hmm. over time here. Um, Regarding the Black Artist Design Guild, I saw that you are not taking more applications until January. Mm -hmm. So how many members do you have now and why do people have to wait to be members? Well, we have uh, about 100 members right now and we are in the transition of changing our system over. So we wanted to wait until we did that before we start accepting. You could apply and you'll be put on a wait list, but we're just not gonna review anything until the beginning of the year. Because we wanna have a time when it's like a one time where it's open open call. So kind of everybody could join around the same time. It's just more of the back end to make things run smoother. And what is the next event that you have? Planned. Well, besides Obsidian launch in January, that is like our main, but we do have a talk next um, Friday with Erica Huggins, who's a former Black Panther, talking about um, home and space and community. Layden mm -hmm. Lewis, the architect on Obsidian, as well as Nina Cook-John, and the host is Asad um, Serket, the new editor-in-chief of El Decor magazine. And where could people find information about that? That is on, um, if you go to uh, our Instagram at Bad Guild, and the link to sign up is on there to sign up for the Zoom talk. Okay. Um, Lucy, just to remind everyone, this coming, uh, next, this coming Wednesday, my co-host will be in conversation with, and I'm waiting for Lucy to put it into the chat here because. Uh, uh, I would just uh, speak about it because okay. next week it's right before, during the election oh, hey. week. Right, so course. we decided to uh, pause yeah. the live broadcast for a week. Yeah. However, on Monday, we're going to uh, release uh, an interviews. It's a three part interview with um, Andrea Branzi. Um, in Italian. However, we do have English title, mm -hmm. subtitle. So everyone will be able to enjoy that. And this is the first time that we're doing an Italian language uh, design and dialogue with subtitles. Uh, oh, okay. three, can, three hours uh, of Andre Bronzi, which I think is such a treasure. So please everyone join us for that. Um, and join me in thanking um, Eleni Barnett for uh, today's talk. Thank you so much. This thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I feel like we just got started, but hey, that's how it goes. <laughs> you and I can continue the conversation offline. We can.